Welcome back to The Breakfast. Now let's talk about what happened today in history, the 8th of January, and we're going back to, first of all, 2016. Um, he is popularly known as one of the biggest drug lords in the world. You know, most people would remember uh, Pablo Escobar, but after Pablo Escobar's reign and after his, you know, uh, death, there comes the guy, Joaquin Gosman. He's popularly known as El Chapo or Shorty because, of course, his uh, height is only about five, uh, six. Um, he was captured today um, in 2016 after escaping from a uh, Mexican jail, a maximum security jail in Mexico. He was a former leader of the Sinaloa cartel and also considered one of the most powerful drug traffickers in the world. Had a net worth about uh, $2 to $4 billion. Um, he has a very, very long and interesting history, you know, when he started his drug trade. Eventually, he started sometime in, in, uh, in the 80s, you know, 1980, I believe, or so, actually sometime in the 60s, and then um, eventually joined one of the cartels in 1980, then started one of his own, or started his own cartel after the arrest of uh, Miguel Felix Gallardo, who he worked under in the 80s. Uh, the Sinaloa cartel was uh, founded in 1988 by Gosman, and it oversaw operations of cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin, which were produced and distributed across the United States and Europe. And of course, uh, that led to a very, very long decades of him uh, being wanted, a wanted criminal, wanted drug lord in Mexico and in the United States. Um, in 1993 was when he was first arrested, um, and then in uh, February 2014, um, when uh, he was arrested once again, but he always kept escaping from jail. The last time he escaped was sometime in 2015 when he um, snuck out through a tunnel in the bathroom um, in the Mexican jail. But of course, once again, was he was arrested today in 2016. There was an $8.8 .8 million um, um, price on his head, um, hoping that he would be uh, found. Um, and so, yes, this is his, his story. It's a really, really long story. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to talk about El Chapo. But if you look deeper and you read very, very well about El Chapo, there's so, so, so much. He's rumored to have killed um, um, two to 3,000 uh, people in the time that he was um, a drug lord. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, today, January 8, 20, uh, 2016, El Chapo was uh, captured. He eventually, of course, got, not long after that, was extradited to the United States and currently faces a life term and 30 years um, um, extra for his uh, crimes and for his, um, of course, the things that he was charged with, drug trafficking and the likes, and, of course, murder. Um, he's currently in jail in New York. I think what's, what strikes me about uh, his story is about how no, not just even him, drug lords generally. They are ruthless, they are violent, they kill anybody in their way, you know, especially when it comes to people they love. Anybody they love and you mess with them, you know, you just have it coming for you. And how they profited so much from the, from the addiction to cocaine, especially selling to the US, you know, selling to consumers, heavy consumers in the US. He profited so much from sales of cocaine that he was uh, the 10th listed as, uh, you know, the 10th man. richest man in Mexico with a net worth of about $1 billion. Just, just amazing. Just it's, amazing. Um, you know, but, but you know, it's really about, you know, the drug business, corruption, um, and all that, you know, it, it encompasses. So it's not, it's not just him now, you know, it's also, you know, there's also smaller, smaller drug, you know, cartels and smaller drug lords in Mexico and in the United States and in Europe. Um, and so it's not, you know, he, of course, will be the most popular one because he, he runs a full cartel. But the drug business is something that, you know, generates billions and billions, billions. of dollars um, every year in the United States and in Europe. And so, yes, it, you know, most of them are originate from Mexico mm -hmm. because, well, that, that, that's where most uh, of, uh, of it is made. But... Um, the business itself, you know, same with human trafficking, generates billions, same with porn, um, generates billions and billions of dollars every year. And it's just amazing to see how he perpetrated his trade, you know, by establishing a shipping empire to make sure that he's controlling every chain of yes. production from growing it on the farm to, you know, distributing it and how they were so clever with finding ways to ship these out. And also... Taking a look at just how many movies have been made about drug lords and, you know, the cartels, it's amazing. El Chapo series, we're talking about Narcos, so much movies. Oh, I love Narcos. You know, lots of movie producers, you know, really cashing out from, 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 those, from those historic stories.
Let's now turn to another another occurrence in history. Today, January 8th, in the year 2002, President George Bush signs the No Child Left Behind Act into law. It was a it was an act or law in the United States that uh, you know created updates to the Elementary and uh, Secondary Education Act of 1965. That act created new standards and goals for the nation's public schools, and it's implemented. Now, this is where this is why the act even became so popular and distinct. It implemented tough corrective measures for schools that failed to meet them. So if you failed to meet the standards of the No Child Left Behind Act, you know, the schools were punished. You know, it included provisions applying to disadvantaged students. The act required states to develop assessment in basic skills. They would receive federal school funding. You know, students would get assessment at all levels. But the act has been heavily criticized. It, uh, you know, they say that uh, the act was basically, you know, drew a lot of criticism. It even led to political resistance. The act let uh, military recruiters have students' contact information, had uh, gave them access to students, required um, highly qualified teachers to all schools. But uh, it was an unacceptable drop. It led to an unacceptable drop in the American public school system. But it was eventually replaced in the year 2015 with the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. It retained parts of the No Child Shall Be Left Behind Act, but attempted to make it less punitive mm. to schools that were underperforming. And uh, the bill affords states more flexibility in regards to setting their own respective standards for measuring schools as well as uh, students' uh, performance. And that's, uh, that's basically what happened January 8th, 2002, President George W. Bush uh, signing this act uh, into law. You know, all I can hear here is, you know, about a country that takes education seriously. Um, yes, there are other nations in the world, in Europe, in, in Asia, you know, that you can say, oh, you know, these ones maybe have... You know, you know, really, really high education standards. Um, you know, and, and uh, very, very interested in the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, but you know, it, it, it may have started as a good, you know, idea. You know, but definitely had its own issues. What's most important is that they felt, you know, that it was important that um, no child, you know, would Should be uneducated, be and of course, they, they would increase by maybe extremely high standards the expectations from education from teachers and from schools. Um, it also, you know, increased the level of qualifications that were required for teachers in these schools. And so, um, yes, you know, once again, may have come and started, you know, as a great idea, um, but maybe had too much, you know, that the standards were too high. What's important, once again, is that they were interested in doing it, you know, and I think it's something that we also should start to, you know, have such ideas. Let's have such you know, um, acts and policies in implemented Nigeria. here in Nigeria. Yes. Let's 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 look at the millions of people that are out of school. You know, and children, uh, kids that are out of school. We currently have the highest in the world. Let's look at that and see how much more we can, how much better we can do with getting these kids into school. Everybody drives around Lagos, Enugu, Benin, you know, Abuja, everywhere in the country, and you see these kids, eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds, wiping your windscreen. Hawking, um, and it's 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 sad seeing that these people that deserve an education and deserve to be protected and, ed and educated by their government have been failed. Um, it's not the easiest thing to accept, but that's what the truth is. They have been failed, and so we should have more policies that ensure that every single child is educated, not the school feeding program. Um, yes. That's that's not well. Okay, you know they want to feed children in the school, but it's really not. It's not a policy that will encourage more kids to go to school. Let's have, you know, a, a if, you, if you want to, you know, create free education, you know, to a certain level across the country, and that is law, then let's do it. If we can afford it, then let's do it. I'm sure that we can afford it. We can it. do it. We um, can do it in the country. So more policies with, with regards to education. Um, let's stop having strikes for nine months. Come on. Terrible. What percentage of our budget do we put into education every year? These are great questions that we should be asking when we nominate leaders and when we have people trying to get into certain positions. Um, what new laws, you know, do you think you will be putting in, in power or in place with regards uh, these uh, sectors of our lives? Um, the National Assembly, the ministers, the presidency, governors. How much, you know, interest do you really have in education? Um, um, before, of course, you you campaign, um, and, and and these are questions that we should ask, really. When people are campaigning, when people are trying to get into office. But, but it's weird that, you know, even the standards for getting into public offices are not even as high as, you know, the average Nigerian. Because you find out these people, 
they usually have one controversy with their certificates, maybe, you know, certificate forgery, they forge their WIAC, they exactly. forge their... So, you know, you need people who actually are educated. Maybe let's even look at people who have master's degrees, people who have, who know the value of education to be in positions of power. Because if you have somebody whose WIAC certificate is in question, how do you expect such a person to prioritize education for the young man or the young boy on the street? So the quality of our leaders, just like Iyayetok was saying yesterday, is very important. So right. that's, it. That's, that's what occurred uh, today in history, January 8th, 2002, and as well as the arrest of El Chapo, right? Yes, uh, in 2016. Exactly. Um, after he, of course, once again escaped from prison um, for the third time. Um, notorious prison, um, escape, prison breaker. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we're taking a short break. When we come back, the NIMC workers have decided that they will not be putting themselves in harm's way and they are going on strike. Um, until the government uh, makes better moves at protecting them in the in a pandemic and of course uh, you know provides better working environment for their staff and so we're going to be talking about that with uh, Babajide Benson uh, and, and getting to see how this affects NIN registration and what level of responsibility the Nigerian government should be having to its workers stay with us <laughs> 